I want to tell you the second half about that story with my neighbor here real quick. 337. While you're flipping to the page, I had to rebuild a fence line with the neighbor on the opposite side of my property. This one was on the west. This next one was on the east side. We literally share a fence line. His father has a reputation amongst all the farmers and ranchers. He's a real stickler to get along with. If you're a neighbor with this guy and you share a fence line, you might as well plan on just doing it yourself. You know what I mean? You, some, sometimes God gives you a hard neighbor to love. And those are the most exciting, if you ask me. Well, this young man showed up and I, I offered him a proposition that we could work together to, to fix this fence that was run down, broke from my dairy cow, popped over the top of it, headed dead for the highway. I thought she'd get smacked on the grill of a Peterbilt. <laughs> And this young man came over to our house, and I, we just built a, an amphitheater, and we were getting ready to have this Hymns on the Hill concert I told you about. And I told him that, you know, we love the Lord, and he just outright rejected me right there in my driveway. Put his hands up. He said, no, nah, we don't do that church thing. Don't, don't go there with me. And you know what? You might have that. And those are really fun. Get excited. When you get the palm in your face, I don't want to hear that. That's enough. You pray. And you pray unceasingly. A few months went by and this young man had met a young lady at, at the university. And this young lady was a woman of faith. And I didn't know all this. But this man, uh, he went to church with this young lady. And saw that having faith, he didn't grow up in a home where marriage was guided by and knowing the institution that it was brought forth. And what he wanted to give this young lady because her loved her dearly was she wanted a Christian marriage. That was what she wanted. That was her demand. Well, this young man calls me out of the blue about two months ago. He says, hey, you, you going to be home tomorrow? I'd like to stop by and talk. So, <laughs> sure. Well, when we were rebuilding that fence, it totally passed under my radar. I invited them over for dinner, and the girls and I, and we cooked them double cheeseburgers, chips. We had them for lunch, and we sat at our dinner table. We prayed together, and I had totally forgotten about the rejection of the, of the message I gave them some six months before that. I completely forgot about it. Well, we just did our thing. We prayed together. And Camden had a bit of a tussle in the middle of the meal, and there was some rigidity that needed my discipline. And I pulled her close to me, and he was sitting there at the table watching me, and I said, honey, let's just pray about it tonight before we go to bed. He came and looked at me and said, okay, that's good enough for me. And it was resolved. Well, apparently that had a big impact on him. And he went and told his girlfriend, after they'd been going to this giant mega church in Wichita, thousands of people, biggest padded seats you've ever seen, smoke <laughs> machines, the pastor shot up out of the stage, I'm sure, for the biggest theatrical entrance for the service. He came and said, listen, after we had lunch at your house, I went home and I told my now fiancé about you guys and your praying and your ministry and you just discipling me that day. And, and I asked her to marry me. We're going to get married. And we've been going to this church, but I really don't know the pastor that well. In fact, we've never met him. We've never talked to him. She asked me if you would marry us. I was like, brother, you mean to tell me you felt discipleship just by sitting at our dinner table together and us praying together and, and having a time after what we went through together as neighbors before that when you were not wanting to hear about Christ? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, we'll bring your fiance. Let's have dinner. I called Luke and I was like, dude, you're never going to guess what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, we just baptized neighbor on the west. We're going to marry the ones on the east. <laughs> <laughs> I never intended on ministry. I didn't, I didn't sign this up in my credentials. It's just part of what we do. It's just part of what we do. All of us. God has placed you in places of work around people that are broken and lost. And when you come to the huddle on Sunday to join up and you're banged up and you're bruised and you need a shot of 
communion or the body and blood of Christ where most athletes take Gatorade. We come here and have communion together and we, we rub shoulders together and we're right back in the trenches on Monday. How exciting is that? I love this song. Joel's going to play it with us. It's called Pass Me Not a Gentle Savior. It's a, it's a humble cry.
may we know thy word and the promises that lie therein. Standing on truth, exactly how Mr. Luke said it last night. We trust you, Lord. We only trust you. Do not pass us by. Equip us and send us, Lord. We know that you will pick us up, brush us off. For the end of this life, we will say, you will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for the words that Mr. Luke's going to bring tonight, Lord. Continue to soften and work us and equip us as we continue on. Thank you for your time to worship and sing with brothers and sisters, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a fine time with you all. I want to invite Mr. Luke back up. I'm sweating. You know he's going to be sweating. <laughs> we enjoyed the wonderful time of fellowship today with Mom and Dad. We got to see Great Grandma and have a fine sale and a fine breakfast with Pastor John and the men here. And we're excited to come back and to hear the great things in it. I want to invite all of you, if you're ever down in Fredonia, if you ever make the venture three hours south of here, you know that you have brothers and sisters that are uh, ready to receive you, to accommodate you, to offer fellowship and hospitality with you, to have dinner. If you're in the area, I'm serious. You have an open invitation. Come see us. We'd love to hear the testimonies of the word, things that have happened. If you're banged up or you need encouragement or you want to reach out, then we can pray with you. This is not just some weekend, one weekend fling. We just come up here to blow smoke and perform. We came to make new brothers and sisters, so that invitation is, if I speak on Luke's behalf, from the both of us, wide, wide open. You young man, if you need, call us. We'll get rowdy. Appreciate you. Let it rip, Mr. Luke. Yeah, that's why I wore the plaid tonight. Uh, in my, my spring will be hindered from the visual. <clears throat> Pass me not by, O oh Lord. How are we? Good. Because he is good. Amen. Amen. All the time. All the time. All the time. He is good. Praise God. I, uh, Matt, you had, Matt said a lot of things. He meant them all. And, uh, it's amazing when, when we start to realize that this life is more than just what, what the world says it is. How powerful the life that we really do have in Christ is and how faith is not a, a joke but it is a reality in your life how much power there is in that the power of the resurrection is that there is no death and that he is on the throne thanks Pastor John for allowing us to come I told him, I said, it's pretty daring to take a... I hadn't met him until I walked up to the door. There's some rowdy guys like Matt and Luke. I have a dad named Mark, and uh, the elders of our church, we have, I have a brother-in-law named Don. So it's Matt, Luke, Matthew, Luke, Matthew. Mark, and Don. <laughs> <laughs> and almost, almost all the, the Gospels, but... Let's pray. Father, this is your place. We are your people. We come with eager hearts, hungry for guidance, for wisdom, for boldness to do your will. Put inside of us a fire. We know the days are evil. We know that it is the last hour. We see the spirit of Antichrist all around us. That rejects 
you as the Son, the Messiah, the one who took it all away. Let us not grow weary in doing well, for the harvest is white and ready, but the, vin but the uh, harvesters are few. Let us be those few. I stand ready with the sickle. When you say go, we go. Let us listen and guide. We get guided by you. Show us what to do, Lord. Let your spirit guide us. Let our flesh not be in its way. And I serve you well and give you your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Who's ready? Are you burning yet? Are you up? Are you, are you heated up? Let's, let's get to it. Here it is. I want to remind you of what I said last night, and it is the truth of the gospel. Okay? Um, if there was a way for you to remember, I, I like to hopefully convey it that you see the two contrasts of the position in which we were in and the position in which Christ gives us. The position that we are given by sin, Romans 5, 12, that sin by one man, sin entered into the world, and by that sin, death entered to all men. And that sin separated us from God. It brought shame upon the heart of man and cursed his life. And at the end, there was death. That's the position we were in. Shame, cursed, separated, and death. And if we die, cursed and shameful, full of sin, we die eternally because of the wrath of God has to be paid. But in Christ. You know what gospel means? The gospel, gospel was given to people as, a, as an anthem to people to proclaim to the nations of a new king. Send out the gospel. They would have riders on their horses and they'd go to the different cities and they'd say, Hey, we have a new king. He's about to release his new degree, decree, right? And that's exactly what the gospel is. It is the good news that our position has changed because the king has come and taken our place. Our position has changed. In Christ, our shame is now joy because he despised that shame and he looked for the joy of the cross. Remember, the curse was put upon his head. The curse he took on himself. He became the curse for us. He died the death that I deserved so that I may have his life. And his fellowship I enjoy with the Father, the Creator, because he took my separation. That's the gospel. Simple and clear. We were saved from the wrath because Christ satisfied it. The wrath had to be satisfied. It was satisfied on Christ on the cross. It is finished. All of it for you and I. Redeemed, our account is now paid in full. The price of sin has been paid, paid on the blood of Christ. Reconciled to God because Christ made the way. There is no other way. There's no other way. No other method, no other formula to get there. Only through His blood. So we've been, and that. That position change, I say position, and I know that seems like a weird word, but remember, position changes our condition. But it is the same as if I said, as Christ said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Your position must change. I must be in your place, and you must be in mine. To be plucked out. The ecclesia, the church itself, is those that are called out for his name. A people for him. Did you know that you're priests? You're priests for him in this world to preach his good gospel. We're plucked out and justified because of our faith. He has made us just. But from the cross, we don't go from there and say, okay, here is how I live life. All right, so we're going to, how do we put this in application, okay? I believe in Christ and how do I live life now? We do not go to the cross and then say, okay, now I live my life. This is a failure of many lives. 
You do not turn from the cross and live life. You live through the cross always. Okay? You do not start at the cross and then find another way or method in which living life happens. The power is in the cross alone. All right? I'm sorry. It's no program. It's no order of service. It's no method of life. It is at the cross on your knees every day, submitting and allowing him to guide your life. That is the life that we are to be living. If we try to start revival by doing it through any other means of man, it fails. It is in the truth of the gospel that Christ died in my place in exchange. And that sin that I had that was a curse, shame, separation, that is sin. But he gave me his righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for me so that I might become the righteousness of Christ. Now I am worthy of eternal life because of Christ alone. That is the power of the gospel. And it doesn't stop there because revival is... Uh, that's my baby crying. Ultimately, if we seek revival by any other means, there's still death. Because that's the beginning of revival, is the revival of our hearts. That's how it starts. Now how the sanctification of the life in which we live for Christ, how Christ is working in us every day to do His good work, is kind of amazing. Because it's the paradox that I want to tell, talk to you about tonight. Because when you, when you go to the cross... You say, I, I want Jesus. Take it all. I have faith. You've taken it from me. And you go out and you try to live life. And you try real hard in this flesh. I want to be righteous. I want to walk in the right way. I want to flee from sexual morality. I'm going to walk in the spirit so I don't gratify the desires of the flesh. There is only one way. And this is the paradox. In order for you to live in this life, you must die. In order for us to live in this life, we must die. Because in the exchange of my position for his position, I am then now dead. I see myself as dead to this world, as dead to this flesh and its desires. I am dead to all of this um, the strategies of the world, I'm dead to it. Absolutely dead. If I want to live, I must die. <clears throat> what? It's amazing. That's what's so crazy about this faith that we have. It's like you want to be free? Guess what? Become a slave of Christ. Give it all to Him. If you want life, consider yourself dead. It's what Christ said. I hope, you're, I hope you're hearing me because it is so life-giving to give your life up so that He may live in you. Okay? It is life-giving for you to give up your life so that He can live through you. That is how He does His work in the body. He allows those people who were in a bad position because of their sin, saving them, and now they are dead with Christ so that they may live as Christ in this world. That's the whole book. How do you love your God unless you do not die to yourself so you can love your God? How do you love your neighbor if you do not die to yourself? My desire is to stay in my house and be comfortable. Was it comfortable not to talk to your neighbors? No, but it felt good to have the hand in front of your face because you knew he doesn't hate me. I might hate God for a while until he knows who his God is. And know what his God has done for him. And then he will love him for what he's done. We must die. Christ said this. He said, if you want to follow me, right? You must deny yourself and pick up your cross. You know what, what happens when you pick up your cross? It's not like you're going on a walk, on a stroll. You usually go into a hill to die, Right? It's not something, it's not a piece of luggage that you're traveling to France with. We're picking up a cross because we know there's a place in which I'm going to plant it on the ground and crucify my flesh on it. 
If you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross, denying yourself, and pick up your cross. And he says, whoever tries to keep his life, he will lose it. But for my sake, anyone that will give up their life, he will gain it. How does that make sense? It's exactly the cross. Because in exchange, I live for Christ now. And he lives in me, in my place. I am dead. He is alive. When I am dead, he is alive. That means then from the work that happens out of these hands, it is because it is him working and not in me. And there is no boast because it's all because of him. It's all glory for him. Where is my covetousness? It's gone because I'm doing everything for my God. So anything in return of this world that comes to me, it's not for me. It's for his glory. You want to know how to kill pride within yourself? Be dead. Oh yeah. Because if you're dead, you will not accept pride because that pride will turn into glory for your God. <coughs> I didn't do nothing. I'm just being obedient. Because I'm dead. Paul says this. He said, when the law came... Sin entered into my heart and I died because I didn't, know the, I didn't know sin yet. But once the law came, then I understood what sin was. And when sin came, I died. I knew how wretched I was. I knew how deep my sin was. I knew how broken my position was because in the nature that I have been given in this human state, I am a sinful, wretched, disgusting, degenerate person full of pride in my wants and desires. But Christ came, died in my place. Now I live for Him. Right? That's it. That's it. We die so that He may live. If we in our new position seek to maintain and revive life in any other way, we fail because if we do not deny ourselves, if we do not pick up our cross, if we do not repent, humbly submit to Christ and die so that He may live in us, then our faith is worth nothing. Someone who demonstrated that for us, one of the greatest con conversions that you, we know of in the Word, is the Apostle Paul, right? You know the story of Saul, a zealous man for God. He wanted righteousness, but he wanted it through the law, and he wanted to force the curse on, on man. As he, I want to hopefully tell you a picture here. A lover of Christ named Stephen was preaching the gospel, telling the good news of the Savior that came and explaining the exchange of righteousness for sin. Here comes Saul, zealous for God. As the men, they had to take their cloaks off because, you know, they got to get their swinging arm loose. So they throw it at his feet, signifying he was the one who said, kill Stephen. And as they stoned Stephen, Stephen says, forgive them, Lord. They do not know what they do. Echoing the Savior, and he looks up and he says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. You know, I, I have a theory about that, is that Jesus is standing because we know that he's seating, sitting at the right hand of the Father, but I think he stood up and he's saying, yes, Stephen, you did it, buddy. You've died yourself. What, what tells us that he died to himself is because he could look at the people that were killing him and he said, I love you. I'm, I'm sorry that you're caught in this lie. You think I'm evil, but I love you and forgive Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because he was dead already. He was alive in Christ. And then Paul had his eyes open, knocked off his horse, blinded by the light, radically changed, and believed in Jesus in which he was persecuting. I can't remember the reference, but there's a beautiful reference where it says, he who tried to persecute the church is now preaching the thing in which he tried to destroy. That is Paul. 
And Paul says this in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. If we want to live, we must die and let Christ live in us. That is the power of the gospel. That is how the church becomes alive. When the church, is, why do you think that the church grows when it's persecuted? Because the only ones that are able to be persecuted are the ones that are already dead and they're willing to die for what they believe in faith. Can you picture it? Peter upside down, Andrew crossed up 